Hello, everybody. This is Flea Market Fantasy number 11. I'm your co-host, Mike L. And as always, I'm joined by... Michael Dell of the LCS Hockey Radio Show. Yes, and this week, okay, finally, Shocktober is over, so no more horror <laughs> comics for you, Mike Dell. Thank this you. This week is your pick, so let us know what you've picked for us. Well, I went with uh, the all-new, all-different X-Men, number 96, from 1975. Yes. This is the glory days of the X-Men, right? Uh, I don't know if this is the glory days yet. Okay. It, it It's really good, though. Like this yeah, is, is. <laughs> because uh, we should talk the X Men. Even though now it's you know it's uh, an icon of the comic book industry. Back here, it wasn't. <laughs> it was oh. not a popular title. No, when it started out, it was uh, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby only did the first handful, like maybe year, year and a half, right, of issues. Yeah, and for, something. Yeah, for for people that don't know, Stan Lee wrote virtually every Marvel title in the early 60s, and Jack Kirby drew at least two-thirds of them. And with X-Men, he, 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 it was one of the first ones he dropped, I know that. And then it kind of just sparted around for a few years, right? Yeah, eventually they just quit doing new issues altogether. They just ran reprints, and then they didn't even do that for a while. I, I forget how long of a break it was. I think but... it was a about five years, I think. Yeah, so then it came back in a giant-sized X-Men number one mm -hmm. in, I, I believe, May of 1975. And that's the one, the famous cover of the newer X-Men, like your Wolverines and your Colossus and that. They're, they're bursting through the page. Right. And the old X-Men are behind them. That, that cover has been parodied in, you know, so many times throughout mm -hmm. history. But the gimmick there, Mike, it was uh, Len Wein, who we talked about a few uh, times on the show before. He was yeah. the writer of that. And uh, Dave Cockrum was the artist, correct? On those first, I think. Yes. Giant yep. size. And the, the gimmick there was the original X-Men team, your Dream Gray, your Cyclops, your Iceman, your Beast, uh, those kids. They got captured by Krakoa, the living island. Right. And... So Xavier needed some other guys to come in and help him out. So he went around recruiting mutants from all over the world. Colossus, mm -hmm. Nightcrawler, Storm, Wolverine, Thunderbird. Uh, I, I think Sunfire. He even got Sunfire. Yeah, Japan. Sunfire. Yeah, Banshee. That's right, Banshee. And, and they went in and they saved the old X-Men. And then they, uh, they all came back and there's 13 X-Men all of a sudden. So they're like, hey, we got to. You know, do something. So, like, pretty much the old team all split. Because, like, Havoc mm -hmm. and Polaris were part of that team as well, I guess I should mention. You know, they, they were retroactively inserted in, but they, I don't think they ever actually officially joined the team. During yeah, they're, the they're just hanging yeah. around. Right. Yeah. Uh, so all the old guys left, and ladies, they left. And so we were left with this new X-Men. They all knew all different X-Men. Cyclops stuck around, though. He was still the leader. Right. Uh, he and Xavier were still there. But then you, you had the other uh, new characters. So the X-Men got rejuvenated. They resumed the numbering from the original series. What a concept. So numbers 94 and 95, their first mission was against a fellow named Count Nefaria. Yes. <laughs> he was an Italian aristocrat who was tied into the Magia crime family. And he had this big, I guess he uh, his first appearance, I believe, was issue 13 in the Avengers. Okay. Way back in the day. But his plan here was he was going to take NORAD over, the uh, missile system there for the uh, North American whatever, defense, you know, whatever the hell. All right. the nuclear weapons. He wants to see all the nuclear weapons. And uh, the X-Men go and they stop him. But sadly, Mike L., they don't all make it back. No. We lose. An, who did we lose, Mike L.? Thunderbird. That's right, Thunderbird. James Proudstar. Or is he right. John Proudstar? James. James, right? I think James oh. might be his brother. Oh, you're right. His, his brother, Warpath. That's right. Yeah. Who okay. didn't seem to exist, I don't think, until later. But anyway, uh, so you had John Proudstar. And, and apparently, there, do you know the reason why they killed Thunderbird? Like, I what, think it was just to make the audience feel like anything could happen, right? Like just to keep them on their toes, well, as far as I know. Yeah, but th uh, the reason why they picked Thunderbird, because they had two loudmouth, uh, like obnoxious loudmouth guys on the team in Wolverine okay. and uh, Thunderbird. So one of them had to go, and they liked Wolverine a lot better. So they said, all right, well, we'll kill Thunderbird for the shock value. Because you either do it, uh, according to Claremont and Len Wein, they said you either want to kill a character 
after years when people were really emotionally attached to them or you do it right away for the shock. Mm. So they did it for the shock and it definitely elevated X-Men into a different type of comic book. When you have a character die, mm-hmm. they go, oh, well, this is different. Cause that doesn't, it is all new, all different. Yeah. It's weird because um, there's a couple things that uh, people, again, you, you talk about the perception of X-Men today, and we just think of X-Men as always having been successful. Obviously, it wasn't. The other thing about the X-Men that the movie really brought back is the idea of the the X-Men as a school, right, for mutants yeah. to learn how to use their powers. Because that concept was kind of abandoned pretty early on. Like, I think they said around number eight, they kind of dropped that idea. And with this new um, iteration of the X-Men, it's almost like now you have two concepts in one. You have the old concept of teenage superheroes learning how to use their powers. And then this is more like an international team of superheroes. That was the idea, the idea behind this, right? Because you've got a Canadian, a Russian, a German, an African, J- Japanese, right? Irish. Irish, right? Native, Native American, all mixed together in one. So I think the concept of an international team was thought of first, and then they sort of imprinted it onto the x-men like oh we we could have this could have been a new team of avengers it could have been anything but they just randomly picked the x-men because most of these characters were created by dave cockrum they were actually created for the legion of superheroes eh well two of them were oh, storm, two of them storm, storm and, and nightcrawler. nightcrawler okay you're right okay not most of them then yeah he, he was writing the legions of uh what is it superheroes legion <laughs> legion of superheroes yeah i have no idea <laughs> in oh DC. boy Okay, slide it in. We're going to add that onto the list. All right. <laughs> we'll talk about it later. But uh, yeah, so he had Storm and Nightcrawler ready to go. He was going to run them in a story over there, and then he quit DC. Right. So he took those characters with him, and he, and he brought them here to the X-Men. And we we talked about Wolverine was created in the Incredible Hulk by right. Len Wein, and so he always liked him, and he wanted to bring Wolverine over here. But the other uh, point about this international team is they're all older. You know, Good they're point. not like... They're in their 20s or 30s, some of them, where the original X-Men were teenagers. Right. You know? so, so, that's, they're no, so they're not the world's strangest teens anymore. Yeah. Right. Well, except they're very old. So I guess that would be strange for a teen. Yeah. yeah. Teens. But, so, uh, but that's why you see a couple years later, uh, or I guess probably, what, six years after this, seven years, they, they start the New Mutants. Right. The young kids again. And exactly. Mixed, so to keep the next generation going. But yeah, so it was a big change, and that's why you got them called the all new, all different X Men. But then in the uh, the main splash page here of this issue, Michael, issue ninety six, they, they have the little uh, yellow box at the top of the page introducing them all the children of the atom and all that. Mm. Then Stan Lee presents the Uncanny X Men. How about that? Good point. Okay, so th- there's always a little bit of discrepancy between the the cover logo and the indicia and then the description right like i think at this point the actual official copyrighted indicia if that's what it's called was just still just x-men right um i have no idea yeah if you look at the, <laughs> yeah no if you look at the original series it was still called just x-men and and i think we mentioned this last week i think amazing spider-man was still just called spider-man like they would have referred to it as spider-man number 113 and like the amazing was kind of just flourish on the cover it wasn't until later that they made the official titles uncanny x-men and amazing spider-man i think uncanny i think x-men didn't become uncanny x-men until like number 143 or something like that yeah i think it was the early 140s yeah uh so this issue starts off with uh it's like a couple weeks after thunderbird dies and we should say he dies michael by uh count nefarious flying away in a jet and thunderbird jumps on the jet and Banshee and the other X-Men are like, get off the jet, you know, leave him go. And he's like, no, I'm a, I'm an Apache warrior, and I'm going to take him down. And, and he punches through the plane, and the plane blows up. Thunderbird dies. But oddly enough, Michael, Count Nefaria survives. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah, he came back soon after, didn't he? <laughs> yes. And I guess Thunderbird, they actually brought him back twice. They resurrected him from the dead for a brief times in certain storylines, which... I had no concept of until I was reading up on him. Um, I know. I think they might have brought him back uh, at at 193. I'm not sure about that, but I know that uh, on the cover, it looks like him and it might be his brother. That's his brother. Okay. That's his brother. Okay. It's Warpath. But yeah, these were like the Chaos Wars or something. These are more recent books. Oh, that's later. Yeah, we don't talk yeah. about that. That's what they don't yeah, that, this stuff's all nonsense. Yeah. Uh, when I read about these characters and how they've changed over the years, it, it makes me angry. 
Yeah, <laughs> I fun. agree. We'll get into a little bit more of that later when we talk right. about something else on this issue. But yeah, so uh, X-Men 96, uh, December 1975, we open on a splash page. Uh, it's a nice little page here of uh, Cyclops out in the woods. Uh, we get to see a squirrel's butt, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in the foreground and then in the background we have a, a like a monument of a look i don't know I, I think it's do you think that's real i think it's just imagined right oh yeah it's just imagined <laughs> symbolic right it's Night not an actual deep. monument to thunderbird no but it's face on a uh, side of a mountain there and it says night of the demon which is the mm -hmm. title so what's wow. going on here mike when this book opens what's, what's so cyclops? so cyclops is sort of um I love this sequence. He's he's basically in despair about what's happened. And he's uh, flashing back to the previous issue and how it ended with Thunderbird dying. But the great thing about it is that we're using second person narration, which for those, <laughs> yeah. for the uninitiated, it's when instead of saying your first person is I, uh, third person is he, the second person is you. And so essentially the narrator is speaking to Cyclops. <laughs> yes. And I've already tweeted, I, just so you know, I tweeted this out and I posted it on Facebook and Chris Claremont himself responded. Really? He, yeah, he did. Uh, I'll have to dig it up later. But basically I, I posted it on a, on a Facebook group and Chris Claremont jokingly said, hey, that's what was in style at the time, you <laughs> young ones, you know. But basically there's a scene on, on page, uh, what is this, three, where he's basically like, you know, the narrator's like, you and the X-Men had saved the world from a nuclear holocaust, but you'd lost a man to do it. And try as you might, you can't balance those skills in your mind or in your heart. Can you, Cyclops? And then he says, no. Can you? No. Can you? No! No! <laughs> and, then he, and then he shoots a, a bunch of trees and destroys them all. And so basically, it seems like the narrator's speaking to him. So it's a little ridiculous, but that's okay. Yeah, Cyclops and then, snaps. Because he, he's, uh, he's overwhelmed with the grief and the guilt of Thunderbird right. dying. Yeah, and then what happens is while he's activating his eye beams, he smashes this thingamabob. That's like I like, to, I like to call it a magic obelisk. Okay, okay, that's a little bit more specific. <laughs> yeah, this magic obelisk that has like some sort of uh, symbols on it. We don't know what they are yet, right? Uh, but yeah. uh, so then he kind of walks away and you know goes back about his business and then thinking to himself. And then we know that something, as he's walking away, we see that something's going on with his obelisk, but we don't know what yet. So yeah, we, we see the little uh, Kirby dots, right? Isn't that a Kirby? Kirby, Kirby crackle, right? Yeah, Kirby crackle. The energy coming out of the, the magic obelisk. Right. So he walks away, and then we cut back to a glorious, you know, scene of the X-Men in the danger room doing yes. this training, right, which we all love to see. And then, well, of course, you know, the, one of the first things we're treated to is a scene of Wolverine nearly murdering Nightcrawler. <laughs> yeah, this is, <laughs> this is a very key point in the history of not only Wolverine and the X-Men, but also in comics when you really, really want to break it down. But uh, yeah, they're in the danger room and uh, Colossus uh, is saying, oh, w Wolverine, you surprised me. I, I hit you with full strength and he swats him away. Wolverine lands on his feet and he says, uh, don't worry, uh, it's no big deal. But uh, I want to, you know, coming right back at you here. And uh, what happens, Storm blocks him with her wind, right? Right. And tosses him aside. So Nightcrawler starts laughing at him. Right. And Wolverine gets pissed, and, and he jumps at Nightcrawler, and he tries to just kill him. Like, he just swings at him. Yep. And Nightcrawler teleports away. And uh, who yells at him? Is it Banshee? Or is it uh, Banshee, yes, Banshee. Laddie, take it easy. I'm not going to do the accent, but he's like, <laughs> you could have killed Nightcrawler then, you know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and well, Wolverine just says, yeah, I know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I meant to try and kill him. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. So, but it, it gives you insight into Wolverine. This is pretty rare, especially in 1975, for a superhero to openly admit he was trying to kill his own teammate. Yep. Kill anyone, let that's alone his just... own teammate. Yeah, I know. So that's I a love... pretty big moment. And I, and I love the panel of him uh, swinging through Nightcrawler there in the teleport. That's a great shot. Great. That's a great art in here. I'll talk about that later, but... Uh, uh, so then sorry. Xavier pulls Banshee aside and they're talking and you see Storm flying away around the lasers and stuff in the uh, <laughs> in the danger room. And, and what does Xavier tell Banshee? Uh, he, well, he says, uh, where are we here? So I'm, I'm, it's Scott I'm worried about. He's trying not to show it, but Thunderbird's death has affected him deeply. He's starting to brood, make mistakes. If he doesn't ease up on himself and relax, I don't know, Banshee. I just don't know. <laughs> yeah, the drama. Right. Yeah. 
And then they introduce a new character. Yes. Moira McTaggart. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes, right? Moira McTaggart. Yep. Who was played by Rose Byrne oh. in the next movies. I'm in love with her. I love Rose Byrne, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I know. She's just beautiful. But anyway, by the way, you know that she, Moira, uh, Rose Byrne is Scottish. And in the movies, they have her use an American accent. She you notice Why? that? <laughs> I have no idea. They're idiots. Laura McTaggart is I know. She's Scottish, so it seems perfect to have a Scottish act. And then, yeah, makes no sense. Uh, yeah, but Laura McTaggart. Now, longtime readers of the X Men will remember her as like a, a, a scientific genius, a geneticist who worked on Muir Island, and she had a little uh, laboratory there. And, and Xavier would always go for help, and the X Men would go for her for help. And uh, there's all kind of. She was also the uh, mother of. Proteus, right? Right, right. And that's later, like issues 120 something. Uh, but they, she was known as a scientific genius. Here, she's introduced as the new housekeeper. The housekeeper, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if that was if he was planning ahead or what was going on or what, but yeah. It, see, it seems like he was planning ahead because uh, Banshee says, This doesn't make any sense. Like, why are you bringing this lady in here to be with us? You know, because we're kind of strange. Sure. <laughs> we're, we're the all new, all different X Men. You really want to bring another lady in here to just, you know, and he's like, don't worry, you can trust her. You can trust. Yeah. It seems like Xavier has a plan (coughs) going on, but uh, yeah. So, yeah. So then we come to, this is, could be my favorite scene in the whole book. And that's where we're introduced to Stephen Lang, right? Yes. Stephen Lang. I always mix him up with Scott Lang. (laughs) Yeah. Ant-Man. Yeah. Stephen Lang. So he has this meeting with, um, what is he? He's like a general or something. What is he? Maybe a lieutenant uh, colonel. colonel. Colonel Ross, yes. Michael Rossi. Yeah. Oh, Rossi. Colonel Rossi. Okay. So basically, I love this scene because it feels, well, it's really grounded. Like, it's really realistic. Like, basically, they're having this dispute about uh, the funding that he's using to create. I don't know if they reveal what it is yet, do they? Well, Project they talk- get it. Project Armageddon, which is – they don't get into the details here, but basically it's the government's idea to uh, b- capture mutants or study mutants and then breed their own mutant super soldiers. That's basically what it is. So, yeah. So, so again, this is a real world um, – sort of a, uh, grounded in the real world, and that's why I really like it. So you have these fantastic ideas, but at least it's, you know, it's tied down to Earth. And so they have this little argument here. And the way it ends is basically um, the guy, uh, Colonel Rossi says, Project Armageddon is over, Steve. It's finished. As soon as I get back to Washington, I'm just sorry it had to end like this. So these guys are obviously friends. So as he's walking away, Stephen Lang says, so am I, Colonel Rossi, because that means you must never reach Washington. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> so he's – well, without obviously he's out of earshot, so he's not threatening him. So he doesn't know that he's being threatened. But And also yeah. we see – wait a minute here. I just realized this. Yeah, we see the leg of the a sentinel in the foreground. Now, I don't know if at this point do we know that, that that's all tied together or is that still a mystery? Uh, it's still a, a mystery at this point. But yeah, okay. this this uh, Stephen Lang fella, he took over for uh, Bolivar Trask. Is it right. Tat- Trask? Yeah. Bolivar Trask, yes. He, he invented the sentinels. And then was it Trask's son? Who... Yes, because he was killed and then his son took over, yeah. And then he got in trouble. So Stephen Lang... Uh, is going to continue the work with the Sentinels. But Mike L., if you notice, a couple of the panels in the background there, they got uh, Marvel Girl on like a PowerPoint slide. Yep. <laughs> they got the Beast. Yep. And they're going to build Sentinels of them. They're going to build robots of them. Yes, yes. So Your they're going to yep. So cool, yep. I love the attention to detail, how they're still, like even though the new X-Men have been around for a few issues, they're still showing pictures of the old X-Men because they have these guys haven't met the new X-Men yet. You know, I love that. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. So anyway, so then we cut back to the mansion. And basically now they're kind of just hanging around, you know, Wolverine's playing tic-tac-toe on the coffee table. Yeah. yeah he's well, he's not just playing it. He's carving it into. Yeah. The he's sorry. He's his carving claw. it with his adamantium claws. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that is destructive. That's an, that's an, yeah. It's probably an expensive uh, corner table there. Such eh? a hothead, this Wolverine. Yeah. He gives all Canadians a bad name, Michael. You're right. He does. I have to apologize for him. <laughs> um, and also, he's got his. We should point out 
he still has his yellow and blue costume, which yes. I personally don't like, but at this point he still has. Oh, you don't like it? I prefer the brown and orange. Absolutely. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I grew up on the brown and orange, but uh, I, I like the yellow and blue. It's a good look. I don't know, but yeah, he's still there. Yep. Um. So so then they get attacked. Um. Randomly, they're si- they're sitting there, and uh, oh no, what it is? Wait, what it is? Is sorry, what were you gonna say? Well, they're introducing everybody to Moira McTaggart. Right. And, and you can see Banshee, the Irish fella, he, he's flirting with her. He's trying. He's smitten with Maura McTaggart. Yes, yeah. as anyone would be. If she looks at anything like Rose Byrne, anyone <laughs> would be. Right? Yeah. And then it's kind of funny how they do it, but basically you see this sound effect, Zram, and then Professor X says, good Lord, those are Scott's eye beams blasting full power, and they're right outside. And so then uh, Cyclops gets blown through the window and yeah. crashes onto the living room floor, That's and cool. they're – Basically, he has just been attacked by this giant monster. Yeah, his, identi- cost- his costume's all ripped up and everything. Right. He looks beaten and battered. Yeah, yeah. So, so he's been attacked by this monster who, thankfully, can talk because he identifies himself as <laughs> Kirok the Damned. Yeah. So I am Kirok, little animal. Kirok, the Shatterer of Souls. Kirok, the Slayer of Men. Kirok, the Damned. <laughs> and so what we find out is that when Cyclops was, uh, when he shot that, magic obelisk he re- well we find this out later but he released this demon right yeah kirok now explain what kirok looks like michael describe him paint a picture okay so i'm gonna do my best here so he's actually a really cool design but he kind of looks like the classic idea of a devil with horns these like you know look kind of like a red dragon devil but he has one eye yes but it's kind of weird because the horns are right on top of the eye, so it's kind of like a oddly shaped eye. I'm not sure if that part above the eyeball, like it's almost it's hard to explain, but the eyeball is really oddly shaped. But I don't. Yeah. yeah. And, and he's this, got the, he's got the big fangs, the forked tongue, uh, the wings, and he's like red and purplish, and right. yeah, very, it's quite very the demon. Cool. Very cool. Yes. And so he has this. I mean, I'm sure this is your favorite part of the book, right? Yes. It's the cuffs. Awesome. Yeah. It's a great fight scene. Yeah. Yeah, really long fight scene, um, you know, back and forth banter, you know, everyone using their powers in different ways. Professor X trying to kind of guide everybody from the sidelines, which is always good. And then we have, you know, we talked about, you know, um, you know, landmarks in superhero comics. Well, we kind of have another one with, with Wolverine, right, where he attacks this demon and he thinks he's killed him. So he says... 10 years of psycho training, a hypnotism, yeah. a drug therapy, 10 years of praying, and I cut him to pieces without a thought. And he's like, you know what's even funny? You know, when I want something funny, I'm glad. So another, right? That's another sort of... Yeah, yeah you, could, you, you could argue this is his first berserker rage. Right. In Wolverine history. Be, because Cyclops is shooting him, uh, Kirok with his eyes, not doing anything. Storm's trying her weather stuff, not really doing anything. Colossus is punching him. Not doing much. Nightcrawler comes in, punching him. Not doing much. Then Wolverine just goes in and just slices him to ribbons. Just guts right. him, shreds him. So the demon's dead, or is he? <laughs> apparently not. Yeah. Uh, apparently he's still alive. And then, uh, so then Professor X d- decides to mind probe him. Yeah, that, that sounds very dirty. What you did. <laughs> uh, but the demon, he like reconstitutes himself. He reforms himself. And not only that, Michael, but he's sapping the life energy from the X-Men when they fight him. Right. So the, the more they fight him, the weaker they get and the stronger he gets. Exactly. And there's, there's a panel of like Wolverine looking very sad. <laughs> it's a great panel, eh? <laughs> yeah, he just looks like very sad. Yeah. Sad Wolverine. <laughs> sad Affleck, right? And then, we, and then we have a great panel, though, uh, like a psychedelic panel of yeah. Professor X in his mind, right? Yeah, he went in this demon's mind, and he sees some things no mortal man should ever see. Yes. You know? and, and it freaks him out, and he collapses. Banshee comes in and, and hits him with the sonic scream to knock the demon away from the Xavier. Then my favorite moment, Michael. Oh, <laughs> I forgot about this. Yes. This is the best moment of the comic. <laughs> Describe what happens next. So, yeah, so all of a sudden, Moira McTaggart bursts <laughs> through the, the door and says, well, a sonic blast will do no good. I can't do the accent. Let's see how Yon Kelpa fares <laughs> against close-range yeah, machine nope. gun fire. She has a, a M16, I think, yes. right? Maura McTaggart, the, the Scottish lass, he's coming here to uh, be the house know, clean the house. 
Yeah. <laughs> burst through a door without warning, firing an M16. It is amazing. I love it. I love it so much. Yeah, but then Banshee, he he just grabs her and says, hey, you're in over your head. Like, he, he's rescuing her. I don't think she's in over her head, Banshee. She, uh, this lady just charged in, kicked down a door with a machine gun. I think she's right where she needs to be. She knows what's going on. Yeah. Tell me about it, eh? <laughs> but no, she's just a girl, so Banshee has to save her. So uh, she's curious <laughs> way, yep. <laughs> but, uh, so then they, they got to concoct a plan. Like, what, what are we going to do? How, how can we beat this demon? And Xavier says, uh, well, it's got to be that magic obelisk. Right. They call it a cairn. Uh, yes, the cairn storm. You must seal the cairn. Yes. Yeah, so, so they send storm. Now, I'm not sure why storm was the one to do it necessarily. I guess she could fly maybe. So they're like, yeah, you go over there and hit it with the lightning bolts. So, yeah, I think only two of them could fly, her and Banshee. So yeah. might as well be her. Yeah, and, and when she goes there, though, Michael, she, uh, there's other little demons <laughs> in Cockrum. He, he really went all out drawing these little demons with the big eyes and the goofy teeth. Yeah, I love these, yeah. And, like, she can't really see them. They're kind of, like, invisible, but they're uh, stabbing her and fighting her and stuff. And um, Well, they're light and shadow. They're made of light and shadow. Like, uh, they're not really tangible, I guess. I don't know how to describe Yeah, um, I don't know. Are they tangible? Uh... Well, it seems like... Uh, but oh, yeah, she says there. they're not real. They're just, like, things of smoke and light created by the Cairn. So I think it's psychological, yeah. But they're hurting her, and, and she's in trouble. And then she uh, she hits the uh, obelisk there with a big old lightning bolt. Mm -hmm. And then she has a flashback, Michael. Yes, I love this. Because Storm is, um, what's it called, uh, claustrophobic. Yes. So she has a flashback to her days in Egypt as a young girl, uh, one of them is her kind of just walking through the streets and the next one is her, uh, buried. And I think that's where her claustrophobia comes from, right? Yes. Is being buried at this young age. And so she has flashbacks to that. So it's obviously, uh, psychological warfare by the demons, right? Yeah. And she just says, you know, I, I got to break free and I shall be free. Yes. There's a big panel of her blowing up the uh, obelisk with all her lightning and uh, all her weather powers. Mm -hmm. And then back Meanwhile, back at the ranch, the demon just disappears, right? Yeah, he just crumbles into dust once right. the obelisk was destroyed. Yep. And that's the end, pretty much. Well, and Storm comes back and everyone's happy. They're like, oh, well, you know, we don't know what happened there, but at least, you know, we survived. God help us all <laughs> and all that. Uh, but then the last panel of the issue, Michael. Yes. I want to talk about this in detail later, but then we have a single panel that basically describes how Colonel Rossi's plane, or what is it, helicopter or plane? But anyway, Sorry. it's exploded and it's in flames and he's dead. Yeah, yeah he's dead. Um, well, he's not really dead. He's not really dead. Oh, he's not. Okay. No, he's not but then it says at the bottom, and miles away, a man who has done enough this night watches this scene on his command console and laughs. So obviously, this was nice. somehow done by Stephen Lang, right? Yes. Yeah, he threatened him. You know, you're going to end my funding for Project Armageddon? Oh, I'm going to end you. And he you takes down the plane. Yep. And then uh, the next issue, we see uh, some old friends return. And the X-Men suddenly find themselves locked in a battle to the death. And the shocker we call my brother, my enemy. I love now, it. Now, how many times do you think that title has been used in comic books? That oh, seems like I like, mean, Stan Lee himself used it at least 17 times, right? So, And, you know, Stan Lee, uh, he had a brother, you know. He did. <laughs> a lot I, of people myself, don't realize this. Something yeah. was on his mind. Yeah, Larry Lieber. Larry Lieber. Yeah, Stan Lee wasn't his real name. He was Stan Lieber. He right. To Stan Lee. Yeah. All right, so there you go, X-Men 96. Uh, it's a great issue. Yes, <laughs> I really I love enjoy it. it. Um, what other notes about the story? Well, let's talk more about McTaggart, because this is her first appearance, and that's a monumental moment in comic book, at least for X-Men comics, that sure. it's more McTaggart's first appearance, and she's wielding a, a machine gun. Yeah. But... Mike L, do you have any concept of what they've done to Moore McTaggart over the years? I, oh my God. Um, like when I was I, reading up on her, this is, her new history is just confounding to me. I had no idea. I, I got to say, I'm with you in that whenever I read about anything in, in comics past a certain point, I just, I, my stomach churns, you know? <laughs> but um, what specifically are we referring to? Like, what have they done to her exactly? Well, they retconned her history, and now, uh, and by the way, the retcon retroactively or retroactive continuity—you go right. back to change things. 
And uh, they changed it. So she was a mutant all along. And her mutant power is that she can reincarnate. Oh. And so they came up and she's, uh, I guess, Destiny. Remember Destiny from the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants? The site? Yep. She told her that she has 10, possibly 11 lives maximum to live. And they've done storylines in all her lives, I guess. So mm -hmm. she's technically possibly in her last life now. But they have all these detailed stories that, like, she was part of the original X Men. She did all this other stuff, and like each life, she gets reincarnated. She does. She changes her life a little bit to try and improve it. You know, to okay. Get better, to like meet Xavier earlier, to do these things. But yeah, it's very detailed, and I, I don't know, man. I don't know if I like it. <laughs> I, I I already don't like it. No, I don't. I liked when she was just a lady. <laughs> I, they, you've got to have normal. Um, characters in there to ground it right like yes. she's one do you remember um the x-men or kitty pride had a dance teacher named stevie hunter yes yeah like you've got to have those characters in there right to keep it grounded in reality not everybody it, it, can be a mutant yeah it's kind of like the i vampire story we talked about last last week right. everybody turned out to be a vampire at the end yep. and, and that's really where uh x-men i love the x-men like uh when I was in the early days, it was uh, Spider-Man, Captain America, that kind of stuff. And then when I got to be 11, I bought my first issue of the X-Men, X-Men 207. And then I was nothing but X-Men for like the next three or four years. I loved the X-Men. I went back, got all the old issues. Loved the X-Men. But then the more popular they got, the more mutants they started making. And it just became too much. Because when the X-Men was at the best, mutants were still rare. Yes. You know? There's only like 30 or 40 in the whole United States or something. Tops. Yeah, you're right. Now everyone's a freaking mutant and it's just terrible just terrible uh what can you tell me at what point you feel like it lost its way or you lost interest probably when they debuted the villain mr sinister Ooh, <laughs> because okay. that is a terrible name a yes terrible... now uh, i guess if you do you know anything about the history of mr sinister and the creation of it and all because I guess the, the idea behind it, Chris Claremont created him, and his idea was that this was a character, like, I forget all the, because they have so well, many, Nathan Summers and Scott Summers' yeah. kid. It was supposed to be, like, a, a child's creation, well, a child's you know, version of what a villain would be, and I guess yeah. that makes sense. But, I actually, no, I, I actually interviewed him, and I asked him, and he, I think what it is is Nathan Summers, or whatever his name is, Nathan Essex, He's supposed to be an extremely long-lived person, right? And so for him, let's just say he's 100 years old. Well, in his, in his uh, aging process, 100 years old is like a 10-year-old to us. So he has the mentality of a 10-year-old. And so his concept of what he looks like is a 10-year-old's idea of what a bad guy or a villain or a monster looks like. And so that's why he's called Mr. Sinister, and that's why he dresses the way he does. That's, yeah, the, that's the way he explained it. It makes sense, but it just didn't it's, work for me. No, it doesn't and, work. And all the apocalypse stuff, I hated all that. So that's because, again, it's just too much, too much. Keep it simple. I'll, I'll just say quickly, I the first issue of X-Men I remember seeing on the stands was around 202, I think. So around the same okay. time as you. Yeah, but the but, Sentinels. The Sentinels yeah, that, are on the cover. Of that. You got it. You got it. But... I, I didn't read an issue of X-Men until uh, an issue of Classic. I, I managed to get an issue of Classic X-Men. I don't remember which one it was, but I think it was the one with Arcade. where they. Oh, Arcade. yeah, those, those were all yeah. Arcade. Yep. But uh, that X-Men run, like from 200 to two, probably 16, 17, that's great stuff. Great I stuff. agree, yeah. I, you know, it's funny. I do like a lot of people, like a lot of old-time fans feel like it got really bad around number 180, no, 190, no, 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 yeah, I like that stuff too. Yeah, I think it's fine. For yeah. me, though, I, I became like a devout X-Men fan around issue 270, right when Jim Lee had become the regular penciler. Mm. And then I stuck with it uh, maybe till about, I don't know, maybe two – or sorry, I, I kept buying it after Chris Claremont left, maybe till about 325 or 330. And then after that, I still bought it, but when I look at the covers, I don't remember the stories. I don't remember anything because I – I, I, it just became unreadable. And then I, I think I dropped it right before um, Age of Apocalypse around that era, which a lot of people liked, but I never read it. So, Yeah, I, I, I know I quit. Like, even though I was checking out with the Mr. Sinister stuff, I still hung around for a good, you know, 10, 20 issues after that. Sure. And then I took a break and then I came back right around 300 and I, I bought it for probably like maybe a year or so. And I went back and got some old back issues and stuff and was reading up on it. 
like I read all the Bishop stuff and Omega okay. Red and all that stuff like after it happened, but I went back and read it. But uh, yeah, it's just not the same. Like after yep. the mutant massacre, it just it's never the same really after that. I would say. Um, but that was so good though the, from that run of the mutant massacre. I, yeah. I also I have to say one more thing is that in the past year or so, I've made a concerted effort and I've now read every issue of X-Men from 94 to about, about 350. So hmm. I've read every Chris Claremont X-Men um, plus more. I was just thinking when I was uh, going over my notes here for the big show, I don't know if I've ever read giant sized X-Men one. Really? Yeah. Like a- actual, I don't know if I actually ever read that story. Uh, you wouldn't have read it in classic X-Men? I don't know. Did they reprint that in class? Oh, yeah. Number one. All right. But, so I guess I did. But I here's the thing, though. It's heavily truncated because what they did was in the original story, there are, I mean, you would actually like this. There's pages and pages of fisticuffs, okay? Oh, great. But, <laughs> but when they reprinted it in um, uh, classic X-Men number one, they cut out most of that. And they filled in pages, new pages, uh, drawn by John Bolton. And they're actually really, really well written scenes um, where you kind of find out that the new X Men and the old X Men weren't really getting along. And they yeah. kind of, and they kind of explaining why the original X Men ended up leaving. So it's okay, actually, I remember that stuff. Yeah, they showed uh, Wolverine and Jean Grey flirting around. Right? Exactly, and and Nightcrawler and Angel. I think they get into an argument or something. I can't remember. Or no, Wolverine and Angel. Wolverine was getting in arguments with everybody. Yeah, <laughs> he was shooting his mouth off with everybody. But yeah, like I can't remember the details of them beating Krakoa though. Like, uh, they, yeah, they, they. I think they only devote like one panel to it. But in the original story, it's like a full chapter. Okay. Yeah. See, that's what I mean. I need to go back and read the actual fight yeah. in Krakoa. But anyway, um, one other note on Kirok before we move on here, the demon. He okay. was actually a uh, an Angari demon. Angari. N yes. apostrophe G A R A I. Never heard of him. But I guess they're a demon race that uh, actually uh, populated the Earth many, 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 many years ago before humans, and uh, that's why he was still hanging around. I guess. <laughs> actually. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I noticed that detail, and I, I, I don't know if I don't want to give, I don't know how much credit I should give because I do think Chris Claremont's a good writer. But I wonder if he purposely gave that backstory as a parallel to what Stephen Lang says when he compares humans, oh. Cro Magnons, and mutants to Neanderthals. Oh, it's interesting. You yeah. got to wonder, right? If uh, maybe, or maybe it was just random. I don't know. I think it was random, but I like okay. it. I like the yeah. I, like, I like where your mind's at, Michael. I like that you're thinking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for once, right? That's really good. All right, so let, let's get into the creators. Uh, the writer, Chris Claremont, he's synonymous with the X-Men. Yep. Uh, he's born in 1950 in London, England. He studied acting in college, and he used the method acting a technique uh, to focus on his character's motivations. Mm-hmm. And you could tell, because uh, he did bring in, uh, I don't want to say, a lot of people say soap opera elements. Yeah. To the X-Men, I would say. But he, he really was very concerned with their personal uh, motivations of the characters. Mm-hmm. And I think it was a big change for this era of comic book writing. It was, yeah. especially with, with all the side characters and everything, they all had their own motivations. They all had their own, you know, desires and goals. And so it was, it was really well, good, good stuff here uh, by Chris Claremont. Um, he started as a gopher and an assistant editor at Marvel in 1969. Mm-hmm. And he received his first credit as a plot assist on X-Men 59, written by Roy Thomas. Yep, Roy Thomas, Roy the boy. His first writing gig was on an Iron Fist, an ongoing Iron Fist story in Marvel Premiere 23 in August of 75. So uh, not too long before this. And uh, John Byrne joined him as the artist on those Iron Fist stories uh, two issues later. And they continued to do the solo uh, Iron Fist book when he got his own title. That started in November of seventy five, and they did uh, fifteen issues, mm-hmm. so seventy five to seventy seven. I don't, I've, I don't think I've read any of those, but I plan to. I think I read one or two of them. Okay. I, I wasn't an Iron Fist fan. Like I like the look of Iron Fist. I like his power. I like everything about it. But then when you read the stories, uh, it, it's it's just like a rip off of Batman, kind of. Okay. Yeah. Like, like a rich guy who owns a company and his family dies, and he. Mm. So I would. I don't like rich people, in general. 
Me neither. I'm with <laughs> so, you on that. Yeah. So if a superhero is a rich guy, I'm out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I like the struggling kids. Like, is that why you hate Batman? Yeah, he's an elitist prick. Okay. You know, Bane is a man of the people. Okay. Okay. All right. That's a conversation for our Batman episode <laughs> coming up soon. Yeah, I got to tell you, I am shocked that we're 11 episodes into this, and technically we haven't done a Batman issue. You did the Brave and the Bold thing with Batman and Superman, but that's eh, whatever. But we haven't done a Batman issue, so I, I can only assume you got one in the holster coming up pretty soon. I'm not going to say anything, Mike, right. leave right. it to We we'll leave it as a mystery. All right. All right. So, so Claremont <laughs> took over the X-Men with issue 94 when, you know, they're starting out the all new, all different. And he's, he went uninterrupted, Mike Gale, for 17 years on X-Men. Yes. From issue 94 to 279, no breaks. He mm-hmm. didn't miss an issue. 17 consecutive years writing the same title. Is that a record? I don't know. You know what? That's a great question. For superhero comics, I believe it's the longest run, yes. When we're going through these uh, creators each week, they tend to last you know, maybe a year, two years, then they jump around, they go to all kinds of different things. And he didn't even miss an issue. No, it's insane. I think the only, the only guy I can think of that comes close is Peter David's run on the Hulk, which was 12 years. Wow. I didn't realize he was there that long. Yeah. And and while he's doing this, uh, he also did Miss Marvel issues three to 23 from Mm -hmm. 77 to 79. He wrote the first 54 issues of the new mutants. uh, That's right. 1983. He did the first 19 issues of uh, Excalibur that started in 1987 that had Captain Britain and Nightcrawler and Kitty Pride on it. And he ended up doing 29 of their first 34 issues. Uh, he also did nine of the first 10 issues of the Wolverine regular series in 1988. And he did the Wolverine, Nightcrawler, Magic, Wolverine, and Kitty Pride miniseries. And he was inducted into the Will Eisner Hall of Fame in 2015. But uh, so basically, if you read the X Men at any point in your life, you probably read. Chris Claremont's work <laughs> like he, Absolutely, he's yeah. synonymous with the X-Men he didn't really do a lot of stuff outside of the X-Men but when you did dedicate your whole life to one <laughs> amazing body mm-hmm. of work you don't need to do anything else <laughs> this I is agree yeah, yeah he did so much I guess he had did he do Alpha Flight for a little bit too or? no he didn't no no John Byrne wrote the first I don't know maybe 28 issues you wrote and drew them and then it and then it was taken over by Bill Mantlo and Mike Mignola oh there you go yeah and, yeah, we need to mention Bill Mantlo here real quick, too. But um, anything else about Claremont? So you said you interviewed him in the past? Yeah, like uh, about maybe 10 years ago, I recorded a Q&A with him, and I asked him about Mr. Sinister and I think Gambit. And then I did an interview with him after. And uh, he was great. Like, he he's really nice. He's really friendly. He was open. Um, I did ask him why, because I it was one of those things, like, you know, I was never really into, like, chat you know, message boards and chat rooms. So I never really read up on it. So I asked him why he left the X-Men and he was a little bit elusive, (laughs) but you know, I mean, he's probably still a sore spot, but this would have been, so this interview was maybe 2008, 2009 and he'd left the X-Men in I think 1991. And he basically, from what he said and from what I've read, um, when Jim Lee came on the X-Men, Jim Lee had, you know, had grown up on the X-Men 10 years earlier when he was like a teenager. And so when he came to X-Men, I don't know if you're, but you were reading X-Men at this point. It was in this really weird place where they were in Australia for a couple of years. Yeah. The Reavers. Right, right. The Reavers. Yeah. Professor X was out in the Shi'ar galaxy. Um, and it was basically like they were completely removed from the mansion, from the danger room, from Professor X, from the original concept of the series. And so when Jim Lee came on, he wanted to get the X-Men back as close as it could be to the, to the stories that he grew up with. And so as you, when, when you look at the Jim Lee run, you can see one of the first things they do is they get back in their old costumes for a little while. Then they slowly make their way back to the mansion. Then they bring back all five original members. And I'm not sure what the tipping point was, but at some point Jim Lee had certain ideas and Chris Claremont had other ideas and they could not come to an agreement. And so Bob Harris, the editor at the time, sided with Jim Lee because at this point, Jim Lee was becoming a superstar, right? Yeah, yeah like he was that, a hot shot. Right. So at that point, there was Todd McFarlane and then Jim Lee was now the new new guy that was coming up who was becoming a superstar. And so Bob Harris sided with him. Just like over on New Mutants, Bob Harris 
sided with Rob Liefeld over Louise Simonson. Ugh. So that's why she got, yeah, that's why she got ousted from New, New Mutants. And so if you look, as soon as Jim Lee, or sorry, so Chris Claremont basically a, a said, okay, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave, but I, I'm going to still script X-Men 1, 2, and 3, which is the new X-Men Volume 2 uh, numbers 1, 2, and 3, and it, he basically treated it like a uh, severance package. So he knew it was going to make a lot of money. Oh, so it made a lot of, of money. Oh, yeah. It sold 8 million copies. Yeah. So he knew it was going to be big. So he scripted uh, X-Men 1 to 3, and then that was it. He was out. And then if you notice, as soon as he left, uh, Wolver or Jim Lee gave Wolverine back his yellow and black costume from the old days. Uh, I know, I think Jubilee was off the team, then she was back on the team. And there's probably other things that I, I'm not really sure what Jim Lee wanted and what Chris Thurman wanted, but... It was obviously a little bit different. But the, the irony of ironies is that Jim Lee only lasted until number 11 on X-Men when he ended up quitting and then founding Image Comics, right, with McFarlane yeah. and Rob Liefeld. So. Yeah, Claremont would return to the X-Men. He, he would write issues 381 to 389, and then he had a run from issues 444 to 473. Right. So years later, he did come back. Um, but yeah, that, that X-Men number one... It's still the highest selling comic book in history. That's right. That's right. Now, just just for the record, you can go to comic shops today and still find boxes of these things. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it sold eight million copies to sh comic shops. As far as how many people bought it, it's probably still a lot. It's probably six or seven <laughs> million, but it's not eight million. That's for sure. <laughs> they sold a bunch of them. So uh, again, if if you had any history of X Men you know Chris Claremont's work and just some of the characters he created includes uh, Rogue, Kitty yeah. Pride, Phoenix, Captain Britain, Psylocke. Oh yeah, he also wrote Captain Britain for the That's UK. That's right. Uh, Psylocke, Rachel Summers, Emma Frost, Mystique, Sabretooth, Jubilee, The Marauders, Madrox the Multiple Man was his first character creation. Uh, Gambit, and uh, he had a hand in Alpha Flight, I believe, in creating it. Right. Yeah, he probably helped with the personalities because I think John Byrne designed all the characters. Yeah, because they premiered and they made their debut in X Men when Byrne was the artist and Claremont was the writer. So, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty impressive list of creations. So there you go, Chris Claremont. Uh, we should mention. Well, for, by the way, Michael, you've interviewed Chris Claremont. Now he's responding to you on the space book. Yes. We need to get him on Flea Market Fantasy. Oh, that would. Let's That'd be amazing. Happen. Okay, so you know what though? I, I, I hear sometimes that when people have podcasts, they like to have um like goals for for like <laughs> lis listenership. So I'm gonna say if we can get our listenership above uh, 12. Tw I was gonna say 20, <laughs> 20 people, but yeah, 12. All right. Then we'll ask Chris Claremont to be on our show. How about that? All right, sounds like a deal. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh real real quick, we need to mention Bill Mantlo because he is credited with a plotting on this issue. Yeah. And uh, poor Bill Mantlo. Do you, do you have any idea what his life's been like? Oh, well, I know that in the 90s, he was hit by a car. And he's yeah, he, like, I'm sorry. Yeah, he was out rollerblading. He is a 41-year-old fella out rollerblading in 1992. He was hit by a driver uh, in a car, and the driver is a hit and run. He just left the scene, and he was never found. And poor Bill Mantlo has been uh, messed up from that accident, uh, all kind of brain damage. And he's been living in full care uh, health facility ever since, 26 yeah. years. Sad, that is yeah. horrible. Yeah. Um, Bill Mantlo. He was a 24-year-old fella here when he got the credit uh, I, I, for helping Claremont plot this issue. But I guess up until in his early days of Marvel, he was known as the fill-in king. Uh, in, in order to um, not miss publishing deadlines, because Marvel was having a lot of troubles <laughs> missing deadlines, they decided to have Bill Mantlo just write a bunch of issues uh, to be always be on ready, you know, on standby to write an issue to fill in. If they're okay. Late. So he basically wrote issue. A lot of the stuff he wrote was never published, but by this time, uh, in 1975, he had written pretty much every Marvel issue <laughs> available. <laughs> like he'd written yeah. Everything for everything. Every series. Yep. Uh, his, uh, other credits, uh, he, he created uh, rocket raccoon. Right. And cloak and dagger. Okay. Big creations. Bill Mantlo. And he had a lengthy run on the Incredible Hulk. I think he did about five years on Incredible Hulk. 
and he was known for giving Hulk back his uh, intelligence. Um, right. And sensitivity. So he gave him Banner's mind, but in the Hulk's body. So that was... Oh, a big... he also is the one that came up with the idea of the Hulk um, being a manifestation of um, Bruce Banner being abused as a kid. Whoa. All right. Yeah. He came up with that idea. And when Peter David expands on it, but yeah, it was Mantlo's idea. Yeah. So there's, there's your Bill Mantlo. And let's, we also should mention he had a long run on Micronauts. That's right. Yeah. And ROM, Space Knight. The Space Knight. Yes. Oh, and he, I believe he wrote the first two or three or four issues of Transformers. Oh, really? Or at least co wrote them. Yeah. I think at least the first issue. Yeah. So basically, like you said, he was kind of the fill in king. I think at the time he was kind of, um, you know, in the offices of Marvel, he wasn't considered their best writer. But in the age of the internet, he's come to sort of, you know, uh, garner a cult following because he did so many of these books, right? Like ROM and Micronauts. So now he's, a lot of people really enjoy his stuff. I got to tell you, Michael, I'm a little disappointed that you're unsure if he wrote the first few issues of Transformers. Yeah. Because <laughs> I would... I would think that was something you would have committed to memory, like tattooed well, on. I, I, <laughs> okay, brain. you know what? I didn't want to. I, I tell you right now, I'm sure he wrote number one, and he might have written number two, but I believe with number three and four, it was someone else. All I right. believe it was uh, Jim Salakrup. But I'm going to double check that as we're talking. How about that? Yeah, because you know, a couple weeks ago, I was very disappointed you didn't know the Sinister Six, but I think this is even worse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you love the Transformers. Okay, you know what? I'm going to confirm it right now for our listeners. Just so, uh, okay, so let's see. Wait, here, number one, uh, writer Bill Mantlo and Ralph Macchio. Okay. Number mm-hmm. two, Bill Mantlo and Jim Salakrup. See, I had the Salakrup name in there. And then starting with number three, it was, see, Jim Salakrup on his own. So I was right. He did number oh, one and two. There you go. All right. So, no shame. Yeah, I usually save that for the, you know, when I'm in the bar, I'm trying to pick up the ladies that watch the deal, <laughs> but I just wasted it here on Flea Market Fantasy, so now everyone knows what I use, but whatever. That's fine. Anyway. <laughs> right, so let's, let's get to the art. Uh, Dave Cockrum. Dave Cockrum. Love Dave Cockrum. He was born 1943 in Pendleton, Oregon, and uh, sadly, he passed away in 2006. Mm-hmm. I think he, did he have diabetes? I believe so, yes. Complications okay. from diabetes. Uh, his dad was a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Air Force, and as a child, he loved comics. He wrote lots of fan letters to Marvel titles, and one of his letters in Fantastic Four 34 in 1965 led to a correspondence with another fan named Andrea Klein, and he later married her. Really? That's quite the story. That is quite the story. No, yeah. they, they eventually did get divorced, but still. Still. It's a hell of a yeah. yeah, that's great to know. <laughs> Meeting on the letters page. Have you ever had a correspondence with any comic book letter writers, Michael? Uh, no, I don't think so. No, but I'll tell you, I wrote many letters to um, comic books as a kid, but I never had the guts to mail them. Okay, oh. <laughs> never. But <laughs> you then, them in a drawer. No, yeah, exactly. But then finally, the first one I ever mailed, it got printed. Really? Yeah, I, I. It was a response to New X Men number one fourteen by Grant Morrison, and I think it was printed in number one seventeen. Wow! And then because of that letter, a guy, I believe it was named, his name was Mike Norton. He read the letter and then he wrote to me or he emailed me and he asked me to help contribute to a fanzine called Legends APA. Okay. And so I and so basically I started writing for this fanzine for about. I don't know, three or four years or five years. And I felt like, you know, oh, this is it. I'm on the road to, you know, now I'm going to be in the you know, New York Times, going to be yeah. published in Atlantic Magazine. Nothing came out of it, though. Nothing. Oh, it's still, so, it's pretty impressive, though. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I was pretty confident about my writing for a couple of years. And then, it, and then I went back to reality and realized, no, nah, it wasn't that good. It was <laughs> nothing. But anyway. It's not too bad, though. Uh, I was going to say something else when you brought up the letter. Oh, well, you know, a great thing about the old comic books. If you go back and you read the letters pages on the old comic books, they would print the, the letter writer's name and their home address right there. True. Bang. That's right. Yeah. No <laughs> private address. Yeah. Everything. <laughs> so that's how they were able to correspond because your address was printed right there. They doxed everybody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. There you go. All right. So uh, Cockrum, uh, after high school, he uh, he went and joined the U.S. Navy for six years, and he he served in the Vietnam War. 
And during his military service, he started contributing uh, art to, to different fanzines. And after the military, he got a job with Warren Publishing. Okay. And it was that the precursor to DC? Is that what Warren? No, Warren, they were the ones that published, I think, Vampirella and uh, stuff oh. like that. No connection oh. to DC, no. Oh, okay. Nice. All right. Because I like uh, Vampirella is way better than DC. So, all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, his first uh, real work was a uh, Legion of uh, Legion of Superheroes backup story in Superboy 184 in 1972, and he did 11 issues total between 72 and 74. So Legion, the Legion of Superheroes, they were just always in the back of Superboy. Is that how that worked? Uh, yes, and then eventually they took over the whole book, and Superboy got his own series, and the Legion took over Superboy's numbering. It's really confusing. Now explain this Legion of Superheroes for me. I have a vague knowledge of them. Like, uh, I don't know. They, they all had goofy outfits. <laughs> they all had awesome outfits. Uh, basically, to make a long story short, in the 30th century, um, there was a group of teenagers who were, who were inspired to become superheroes based on the, the legend of Superboy, right? And okay. so... With the, they formed a superhero team in the future called the Legion of Superheroes. It started out with three of them, and then it expanded to five, and then to thirty, and whatever. And then, <laughs> in the in their how we're introduced to them is that they travel back in time to uh, Smallville to 1958 or whatever, and they meet Superboy, and um, basically they invite him to join the team. So he basically then th for, for the next like few years or whatever he would travel to the future and have adventures with the legion of superheroes and then the legion be became so popular that they ended up taking over the book twice they took over adventure comics from superboy and then later they took over superboy from superboy <laughs> and that's it <laughs> well, yeah give me some legion of superhero names who are some of the characters okay i'll start with the coolest and i'll go down the coolest oh, wow. one is matter e yeah matter eater lad Matter Eater Lad. Yes, he eats matter, okay? So do I. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he can eat anything, though. Oh, he can okay. eat wood, metal, anything, okay? okay. Uh, then there's Bouncing Boy. He can bounce. <laughs> um, let's see, there's Element. Wait, wait, let me just confirm this. Bouncing Boy is the second coolest. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I think okay. you know what we're dealing with here. Yeah. <laughs> and, and now I'm just going to go random. I'm off the top of my head. We have Element Lad, Cosmic Boy, Saturn Girl, Shrinking uh, Violet. There's a whole, there's like 50 of them. Violet. I like yeah. that. Colossal Boy. A lot of boy names. A lot of, a lot boy, of boy A lot of boy, girl, lad. There's also Lightning Lad. There's Light Lass. Um, there's lasses and lads and boys and girls. It's great. <laughs> okay all right so that's and, and I also have to point out it's one of my favorite co comics of all time but anyway oh wow all yeah. right um <laughs> bouncing boy uh so just think if not for uh dave cochran getting upset with uh i, I think there was something going on in legion of superheroes like a, he had an argument over something and he quit okay and he took nightcrawler and storm with him or otherwise it could have been nightcrawling boy and storm lass <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of that. Right. <laughs> so he went to Marvel and uh, he co-created the new X-Men with Len Wein. And yep. uh, we already talked about the Legion of Superheroes nonsense with uh, Storm. Um, and then he quit and went to DC. But while he was with X-Men, he did issues 94 to 107, 110, 145 to 150, 153 to 158, and 161 to 164. Mm -hmm. So after uh, Cockrum left at 107, that was John Byrne. Then he came right. in. And then after Byrne left, Cockrum helped fill in uh, after Byrne left. Uh, now, I I always love Dave Cockrum stuff because it's classic comic book art, I would say. But I preferred Byrne, you know. See, I used to prefer Byrne, but as the years have gone by, I've grown to love Dave Cockrum a lot more. And I, I do prefer his art now. Yeah, it, it's great. But I just, when I was reading X-Men back then, I was always like, oh, this is a... John Byrne issue, awesome. And then I picked up, oh, this is Cockrum. Eh, right. uh, yeah, it was one of them deals. But uh, I, I, yeah. But, it, but reading this issue, it's just classic comic book art. It's great. Yeah, that, and that's the thing is, um, for yeah, like I, the, it's hard to describe his art style, but the first thing that comes to mind when I look at it is it's pure 70s, right? And, and that's a good thing. I Do suppose. You, yeah, like to, to me, what, like when I look at his art, it reminds me of 
everything that was going on at the time, like the, the, the style used on album covers, the style used in um, like graphic art and even like the stickers, like they all had the same kind of feel. And I can't really put it into words, but he just has a really nice sense of design, you know, like that opening page with um, uh, the squirrel's butt. Yeah, that's the one. No, 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 no. With the <laughs> Thunderbird's face. You know what I mean? And like, even if you just look at the, the, the leaves and like, it's, it's like, his, his he's more focused i think on the design of the panel and like where he's putting the lines and stuff like that and i just re- and like even um the page of wolverine and nightcrawler arguing when you see that panel of nightcrawler standing there laughing even the letters around him i don't know if that was done by the letterer or by dave cochran but it just all seems to fit together you know what i mean it's, it it's all fits together really nicely so i really like it yeah, like so his faces, his expressions can be a little weird sometimes, and his uh, his anatomy can be questionable on occasion. Yes, I agree but with that. It, it's still it's great comic book art, you know. Yes, it's, it's, it's not it, supposed to be an anatomy study. It's supposed to be you know storytelling and emotion and stuff. So yeah. Yeah, like and and then when he brings in the demon uh, Kirok, you can see how creative he is with the design, right? Yeah, and I mean. Like, yeah, it's almost like you could argue it looks more like a kid's, uh, I don't want to say like a kid's cartoon, but it does. But in a good way, though, like it just looks, yeah, like a Saturday morning cartoon or something, but really well done. Now, uh, Cocker, he really didn't do much else at Marvel. Like this was his biggest run was on X-Men. He really wasn't known for too much other stuff, was he? I mean, I don't no, recall. The only big thing he did was um, he created a, a concept called the Futurians. Yes. Which but... was... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, I never read it. I don't know how good it is, but yeah, it's a cool idea. He well, he also created the what are they called? Oh, the the, the space guys. What are they called? The uh the um Star Jammers. Oh yeah, the Star Jammers. Yeah, yeah, and he created the Star Jammers, but for some reason, you know, at the time, like nowadays you think if you have a really cool idea, you kind of want to keep it for yourself. So you don't want to give it away to Marvel Comics, right? So you publish it at Image or something. But back in those days, it was more beneficial to have it in a Marvel comic because you probably make more money from it. So I think what happened was he just basically had this idea for the Star Jammers and they stuck it into X-Men yes. as a way to sort of give it attention. And then to tie it into X-Men, they, they had the idea of making Corsair Cyclops' father. Yep. Right. So, yeah. So that's his other really cool thing. Star Jammers hasn't really amounted to much, but it's a really cool retro, you know, 70s sci fi idea that I always thought was really cool. And they had a, a prominent role in the Dark Phoenix saga. They were right uh, mixed up in there. Um, another interesting note about Cockrum his resignation letter for Marvel. Do you know this story? Oh my God, that's right. It was published, <laughs> right, in a comic book. Yes. Uh, so he got mad at Marvel because uh, I guess at this time, uh, this was like 1979 ish, uh, there was trouble at Marvel. Pete, was this after Shooter came in or was this right before I'm, he came in? I think it was I, right I before know. Shooter came in. Or, or Pete, uh, Shooter was around. He was around, yeah. But uh, basically, the the gist of the resignation letter was Marvel used to be like a family and everybody was a team working together. And now it's just everybody's individual on their own and um, arguing over petty stuff. It's no longer a family, that kind of thing. So he wrote this big letter and he says, I'm leaving. So uh, the letter ran. And <laughs> <laughs> now I'm blanking on who the creators were. Iron Man issue 127. Yeah, because I actually read that issue. Yeah. I think Bob Layton was the artist, right? And can't remember who the writer was. It, it might have been David Michelinie. That sounds exactly David? right. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's Michelini. right. Yep. Because yeah. this was right before they did the Demon in a Bottle storyline right. with uh, Tony Stark being a drunk. Because in the issue, Stark and his alcoholism, he's uh, causing so much trouble for the people in his life that Jarvis, his butler, just says, I've had enough of you. I'm quitting. Right. So he, he leaves Tony Stark a resignation letter, but some scamp... And yeah. the Marvel bullpen. <laughs> now, no one's taking credit for who did this, but they took Dave Cockrum's resignation letter and they just switched out Marvel for Avengers. Like, you know, like the Avengers used to be a big family. And, right, right. And they printed it in the issue. Yes, yes. So when Tony Stark is looking at the resignation letter, that is actually Dave Cockrum's resignation letter. Uh-huh. <laughs> 
I love it. And a couple issues later, uh, how do you say his name? The writer, Michelini? Michelini? Michelini. Michelini. Yeah. I guess he, in the editor's letters page, he had to write a, an apology. <laughs> they made him write an apology. Really? <laughs> they, Cocker, they said, you know, it was unintentional or something, but clearly it was intentional. No, clearly they put a <laughs> lot of work into getting it. Yes, yeah. <laughs> they changed Marvel to Avengers. So clearly they were working on it, um, but who did it? I don't know. But yeah, I guess it caused a lot of trouble at the Marvel offices. People were pissed about it. <laughs> I think it's great. <clears throat> yeah, it's pretty spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Uh, Dave Cocker and Chris Claremont, uh, the all new, all different X-Men. So, Mike, what do you think? One to ten, what do you give issue 96? Oh, my God. I mean, uh, I, I, I don't know. I guess I give it, realistically, I give it an eight. But for how close it is to my heart, I give it a ten, you know? <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, I was going to give it uh, a seven initially because, uh, you know, demon storylines. Eh. But I'm giving it an eight because uh, it's Cockrum, it's Claremont. This is a big time in the X-Men. But you also get those moments with Wolverine, those two classic moments with Wolverine, and you get more of McTaggart busting through a door with a machine gun. Right. That, that's too much. That's great. That gets an extra point easy. Because um, I'm not a big fan of demon storylines, but I thought this was good, the way they did it. Mm -hmm. And they tied in, uh, Claremont tied in Storm's claustrophobia and her childhood trauma into it and stuff. So, yeah, right. it's pretty good stuff. You know, the only criticism I have of the story itself is that I love the setup with um, Stephen Lang and Colonel Rossi, but I wish that that scene at the, the very last panel would have gotten <laughs> its own page, right? Like if we yeah. would have seen, uh, you know, the plane have malfunction and then crash and then cut to a shot of Stephen Lang smiling or something, well, right? <laughs> that would well, have been I guess much they better. They, they did kind of feel thrown in there, tacked on at the end, but I guess they couldn't really do a, too much of a scene with it in, because uh, Michael Rossi doesn't die. You know, so okay, but it's something, yeah. yeah, just something better because it would have been better to to see it rather than have it explained right in the captions. So that's my biggest criticism for the actual writing. But and like like you said, um, demons. I ideally like I always prefer X Men to only deal with more down to earth situations, and I didn't really like them being in space or yeah. Doing Stuff like I that agree. with demons or later on they fight leprechauns. I don't know if you remember that story. <laughs> well, that's coming up next. That's yeah. Like, uh, Two issues away or something, right? My brother, my enemy. That's about Banshee's uh, brother, Black Tom Cassidy and the Juggernaut. Oh, okay. Okay. And they I thought my brother, my enemy was Cyclops and uh, Havoc, isn't it? No, 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 no. no. Okay. Okay. Sure Black Tom and uh, Juggernaut. Okay. Okay. Another brother. Okay. Yeah. No, but wait a minute. I'm looking at the cover of the next issue, and it's Cyclops and Havoc. Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, Cyclops and Havoc in a duel to the death, my brother, my enemy. No, the, the story you're, you're talking about comes a little bit later, but I've read that. Actually, to be honest, that was my least favorite issue of the early run, and usually I would skip it when I was reading these issues. But anyway. You skipped, I, the, you skipped the Black Tom Cassidy? I think, I think what happened, what I would do back in when I was in my early teens is – I, I got to the point where I'm like, because what, what I would do every summer, because I had no life, right, is I would, I would take all my comics and I'd be like, okay, I'd stack up my Superman, my X-Men, my Spider-Man, and I'd reread them all, okay? And then the next summer, I'd reread them all again. And after two or three <laughs> summers, I was like, okay, I'm never going to want to reread this Leprechaun story. So I'm just going to sell these <laughs> two issues of X-Men and keep the rest. But then the next time I came around to reading it, I'd be like, frick, I wish I had those issues. <laughs> so I just buy them again, you know? So, yeah, I, I thought for sure we would get the Leprechaun story next, but yeah, so it's Havoc and, and uh, Cyclops. Huh. Yeah. That's a and that out. issue also, I believe the villain is Lucifer. And that's another non-X-Men-esque concept that I didn't really like. Like this guy who dresses up like Lucifer, kind of ridiculous, but whatever, right? Yeah, I don't like that either. No. <laughs> I'm trying to see how, how many issues away is the Leprechaun story. I, I'm going to guess... Well, it's got to be, I mean, Cockrum only went up to 108, so, oh, 102 is with Juggernaut, yep. so 103 oh, is with, uh, let's see here, sorry, it's just loading, must be 103, yeah, 103, All right. Black Common and, and Juggernaut, so there you go. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, that's the first time we get to see Colossus fight Juggernaut, right? That's so. right. 
they have always had a lot of fights over the years. Yeah, it's um, basically yeah. Like if you look at these early um, X Men by Cockrum, it's almost like I said, it's like Cockrum. If this wasn't X Men, it would have been Legion or it would have been anything. But he's kind of just doing whatever he wants, right? Like if he wants to draw leprechauns, like I know that <laughs> was the writer, but he probably just let him do whatever he wanted, right? <laughs> <laughs> i don't know yeah wouldn't that be great like because you know in the marvel way the old marvel way of producing the artist would pretty much plot he would draw whatever he want and then the scripter would come and put in the the balloons after they right. i mean they would agree on the plot but so that'd be great if like no matter what the plot was the artist sat down and in every issue he just put in a leprechaun yeah <laughs> exactly. and the writer has to figure out a way to get around it <laughs> but yeah so there you go um so what's up next week michael Oh, all right. Glad you asked. So as you know, um, for the month of Halloween, I, uh, I tied it into the theme of Halloween. So I picked two horror related comics. Now, for November, the only real holiday, as you said, is American Thanksgiving. Yeah. And there's no comics I could find to tie in with that. <laughs> but another way to follow themes is to tie our choices in with upcoming movies. So can you think of any movies that I could that are out that I could pause or or coming out that I could tie in my comic choice to? Uh there's a Joker movie out there. There's another movie that's coming out soon, Mike Dell. There is? It's the end of a saga. It's the end of a I have no idea. Oh my god, how can you not know this? <laughs> Star Wars, come on. Oh, they're still making those? Oh god. <laughs> we are gonna review. Marvel Comics, Star Wars, number seven, okay? Oh. This is the first issue that of new adventures after the adaptation of the movie. And I'm looking forward to reading it because I've never read it before. So what year are we talking here? We're talking oh. 1977. Oh, so they really that recent? Like, I mean, that close to the movie? Like, Oh, yeah. Like, Star Wars number one from Marvel actually came out before the movie did. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So if you, it was an adaptation of the movie, but it was published before the movie. So well, if you were. That sounds terrible. Well, Whose idea was that? Well, it, I think it was, it was a way to promote it because back then comics mm. sold so much. You figure it was probably, you know, 300,000, half a million people reading it. So it's like, oh, well, here's half a million people. They're going to see this movie now. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. And so the first six issues of Star Wars were a straight adaptation of the movie, and then starting with number seven, it was all new adventures. And that's what, that's what, that's what we're going to read. Well, Michael, I want to tell you something here. When I was a kid, I loved Star Wars. Okay. And when I was a kid, I had the comic books of Star Wars. Okay. Really? So I may, I don't, I don't have them anymore. I got rid of them a way long time ago. Uh, but there is a chance I have read this issue before. Like, what's on the cover? Can you the see the cover? The cover is Han Solo and Chewbacca. Uh, Han Solo's shooting a gun and they've got two aliens next to them and Han Solo says grab a laser gun Chewie they've got us surrounded <laughs> a laser gun what is a laser gun anyway I, I like that yeah oh by the way we should mention this issue of the X-Men that we just reviewed the, it was a great cover by Cockrum too with the Kirok and all the X-Men oh, on the front cover X hitting them and, yeah it was great but yeah that cover doesn't sound too familiar I'll have to uh, well you know that. what I'll send it to you on uh Facebook Messenger, you can check it out there. But uh, the Star Wars. All right. I man, I just hate Star Wars so much. Now. Why? Oh, okay. well, I guess we'll have to talk about that next week. But when but. I was a kid, I loved it. Hey, Michael, before we get out of here, one other thing. Um, Oh, we're on iTunes now. Yeah, that's, that's a big that's announcement, sure. right? <clears throat> yeah, we are on iTunes. Uh, so you can get this here podcast and all the comic book syndicate podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. But also, Michael... We, we mentioned in the past, when I was a kid, I wanted to draw comic books. You yes. Know? So did so, I. And I still want to create a comic book. And we've talked about this before. Years ago, I told you I want to create a comic book. I've talked to Jolie about it. But I never seemed to do it. <laughs> yeah, that's so, me. Exactly. <laughs> so I was talking to a writing chum of mine this week. And he said, well, you're doing this comic book podcast now. So why don't you just say there at the end that you're going to create a comic book? So then each week, uh, your your buddy there could hold you to it. Ah. So. So maybe at the end of each episode, I starting now, I will start working on a comic book. And maybe each week you can check in with me to see how I'm doing, if I've made any progress. Okay, that sounds good. I will. So we're speaking it out in the world. And, and so then maybe it will eventually happen. And you know what would make it even more, add even more pressure is if our listeners 
if they commented and they tweeted and they posted and they emailed us and they asked you what your progress was in your comic, right? I would love that, but personally, I don't consider th two or three tweets pressure. That's not really. That's not pressure. Okay. <laughs> not pressure. That would require 100% of our listeners to tweet to us. So. Yes. Yeah, that's not going to happen. I'm not, anyway. not going to be overwhelmed by the response, but at least if we every week I have to like give you an update. So you know, eventually I'll get embarrassed by saying that nah, I didn't do anything. Eventually, I'll have to do something. Now, I don't want to, like, rain on your parade, okay? Mm -hmm. But I started a feature film <laughs> um, several years back, okay. and I was hoping that the shame of people asking me when it was completed <laughs> would compel me to finish it. Do you okay. want to guess how long it's it's been since I started this movie? 12 years. 15 years. Okay. <laughs> right. Well, here okay. we go, Michael. At the end of each episode, you ask me how my comic book's doing, I'll ask you how your feature film's doing. There you go. Great. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Okay. So, yeah. So, next week, Star Wars number seven. There you go. Right. So, that wraps up Flea Market Fantasy number 11. And uh, that wraps it up this week. And then, like I said, please tweet us, post, respond, email, share our videos, share the audio, share the Spotify link, the iTunes link. What's the other one you said? Stitcher? Stitcher. Yeah. Never even heard of it, but there you go. If you're <laughs> listening on Stitcher, please share it. Let us know what you think of the comic. Let us know what you think of the review. And until next Tuesday, this has been Flea Market Fantasy. Fantasy.